Hey everyone, welcome to The Net Online. We're so glad to have you here. We're going to start off the message with a short video clip for you to enjoy. After the message, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for future updates and messages, and leave a comment because we love hearing from you. Thanks for joining. You sent for me, Caesar? Caesar. Tell me again, Maximus. Why are we here? For the glory of the Empire, sire. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I remember. Do you see that map, Maximus? That is the world which I created. For 25 years. I have conquered, spilt blood, expanded the Empire. Since I became Caesar, I've known four years without war. Four years of peace in twenty. And for what? I brought the sword. Nothing more. Caesar, your life, please. Please don't call me that. Come. Please. Come sit. Let us talk together now. Very simply, as men. Well, Maximus. Talk. Five thousand of my men are out there in the freezing mud. Three thousand of them are bloodied and cleaved. Two thousand will never leave this place. I will not believe that they fought and died for nothing. And what would you believe? They Maximus? fought for you. And for Rome. And what is Rome, Maximus? I've seen much of the rest of the world. It is brutal and cruel and dark. Rome is the light. Yet you have never been there. You have not seen what it has become. I am dying, Maximus. When a man sees his end, he wants to know there was some purpose to his life. How will the world speak my name in years to come? Will I be known as the philosopher, the warrior, the tyrant? Or will I be the emperor who gave Rome back her true self? There was once a dream that was Rome. You could only whisper it, anything more than a whisper, and it would vanish. It was so fragile, and I fear that it will not survive the winter. So let's, uh, let's look at our message this morning. Legacy, living a life of significance. And uh, we already prayed, which was, I guess, missed on the recording. So we'll have to improvise on that for all those watching. Maybe the YouTubers are out there watching it, my wife being one of them this morning. And, uh, but anyway, we're, we're going to talk about recovering a lost legacy. Last week, we looked at a lost legacy. We looked at Israel and the, the kingdom of Judah, which is the southern part of Israel. There was a divided kingdom. And so Judah was mainly made up of the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. And then you had the other ten tribes in northern Israel. They had become very decadent. They'd become very evil and very committed in that evil. The, the difference is Israel, the northern kingdom, had nothing but awful kings. And they had separated themselves from the Davidic kingdom, the line of David. And they had become more, if you, if you could even be worse than Judah was. But they were both really, really bad. But the, the beauty of Judah is at least they had, uh, out of maybe 20 or so kings, they had eight really good kings. But Israel, corresponding to that, had really nothing. They had nothing but evil kings. And so they were basically, uh, by the time of the Babylonian conquest, Israel was pretty much, the northern kingdom was pretty much obliterated. Uh, Judah survived because they were taken captive into Babylon, relatively intact. And so here we are. So we're looking at the kingdoms, the kings that ruled Judah just prior to the Babylonian takeover. And it's really fascinating because we looked at Hezekiah. And you'll see these. There's uh, Hezekiah, which is the one that we talked about first. Uh, we should have a screen for that. Uh, we looked at Hezekiah, who was the one who said, I'm just thankful the judgment is not going to happen in my generation. I am thankful for uh, that 
I've kind of dodged that bullet. But he knew that judgment would come in the future. And so he shows such a narcissistic view that all he cared about was his own safety and welfare and security. He didn't care about his grandkids and his, his children. And the effect of the, of the decay of the kingdom was just, you know, and yet it was going to get really, really bad after him. And the next one was Manasseh, his son who we talked about. And Manasseh, after decades of living in the worst kind of decadence, I mean, we're talking horrific. We're talking about sacrificing their children uh, in the Valley of Ben-Hinnom. And, and this, it was just unconscionable what they did and how bad they were. And they had become, as the Scripture said, worse than the nations around them, which they were supposed to, <laughs> they were supposed to conquer. They were supposed to you know, push them out. And they were really bad too. But now Israel is, and Judah are under judgment. And Manasseh repented later in his life. And we looked at the repentance of Manasseh. But so much damage was done. There was so much deep damage done within the heart and soul of the people of Israel that his next son, Ammon, who was actually murdered, he was only in, in his kingdom for a couple of years, uh, he was even worse than Manasseh. And it just, it's just a really sad chapter in the history of Israel when you look at it. And then we have a happy chapter, the life of Josiah. This is one of the most amazing stories because here he has these losers for kings and these guys that preceded him, Hezekiah, Manasseh, and Ammon. These awful people. Josiah comes into power at eight years old. So I want to I just pose a couple of questions to you. But one is, what lasting thing would you like to leave behind as you progress through life? So that was kind of the, the theoretical, the fictional story of Caesar Aurelius and his, from the movie Gladiator, and the idea was he was having, I guess, a midlife crisis before he was dying, like, what was it all for? What, what were we as Rome? What was, you know, how will I be remembered? And, but there's some realism in that in the sense that many people will face that as they get to the end of their life. How will I be remembered? What did I really leave behind? What was the significance of the life I lived? Where did I invest? What were my priorities? What embodied the essence of my values and the legacy that I was going to leave behind? And that is a question that every single person should be asking themselves. And sometimes when you, if you ask that question, you realize my legacy is really in trouble. Then we have to step back and go, then what do I do to restore that legacy? What do I do to set myself back on a good track? And so Josiah, when he became king, succeeded, succeeded Ammon, who the son of Manasseh. Josiah reigned 31 years. He died fighting the king of Egypt. Now this is the craziest thing. And it's so sad that he reigned and did such a fabulous job for 31 years. Israel, Judah... Israel, I mean loosely Israel, but Judah prospered under his leadership. And he was 39 years old when he was king, killed by Pharaoh, King Necho of Egypt. Now this is a fascinating person because he was on a, Necho was on a mission. He believed, and this is the odd part, when you look at the scripture, he talks like a monotheist. Now I don't believe Necho was really a monotheist, but he talked like a monotheist. He talked like he knew something of, maybe he was relating to Josiah on his terms. Because Josiah is a monotheist. But he's telling Josiah, the armies, Josiah has brought the armies of Judah out to meet Egypt. And Egypt has a mighty army and they're headed to fight against, with the Assyrians against Nebuchadnezzar. And so they get in this battle array, they're lined up. And King Necho sends a message to Josiah and says, this is not your battle, this is not our fight, this is not our day, let's let it go. Just let it go. And he says, God, I'm on a mission from God, and my mission from God has nothing to do with you. So let it go. But Josiah, for pride or whatever reason, he identified his enemy, it's Egypt, it's always Egypt. <laughs> Just like the Philistines. And so he goes to battle, and yet 
Necho is telling him that God has him on another mission and don't make this horrible mistake, Josiah, by attacking us. Well, guess what? He made the horrible mistake of attacking King Necho and he died. He died at 39 years old. I don't believe it was God's will or plan, but, but Josiah was the one who, who was holding back essentially the judgment of God for all that had happened under Manasseh and Hezekiah and Ammon, and even the kings preceding Hezekiah. It was just, it had, it had accumulated for generations this awful seed of uh, corruption in the hearts of the people. And so here's, here's what happens. So, so Josiah says in 2 Kings, kind of a characteristic verse of his, he says, he did right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the way of his father David. Nor did, he return, nor did he turn aside to the right or to the left. So that was a characteristic statement of Josiah's life and the way he led his life in his kingdom. And so when he was 26 years old, a young man, a young adult man, he ordered that the temple, the house of the Lord, be renovated and restored. And then he found the book. Now it's to be noted that Josiah, when he was 16 years old, he began to really seek after Lord, the Lord. He began to seek after the God of his father, David. He reached back more generations. He reached back even to the early life of David. He knew something of the history of Israel. And so he knew that David had served the Lord and God had blessed him. And so at 16 years old, it says for four years, he sought after God with great intensity. That was Josiah. 16 years old to 20 years old. And so by the time he gets to 26 years old, he's renovating the temple. He wants to restore it, but he's lacking some guidance. So I want to, I'm going to read some, some amount of text, so just bear with me on this. Um, I think it's necessary. We're going to read the Word. A lot of you haven't been reading your Bibles anyway. So we're going to take a moment. We're going to read the Bible this morning. Like, okay, that way I can see I read the Bible this week. That's true. It's true. Shaphan, the scribe, told the king, saying, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. Now, in those days, it wasn't actually a book. It would be like a scroll. Okay. And Shaphan read it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah, the priest, Ahakim, and the son of Shaphan, Akbor, the son of Micaiah, Shaphan the scribe, and Isaiah the king's servant, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me and the people in all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that burns against us, because our fathers have not listened to the words of this book, to do according to all that is written concerning us. Wow. So they had lost track of some truth along the way. A big embodiment of truth. Sometimes we suspect we're bad. And I, I mean, I'm talking about mankind. I'm talking about, you know, when the scripture says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Like, yeah, 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 we're sinners. He died for the sinners, right? We are all among them that were died for, paid for. Of course, when we're redeemed, we, we don't refer to ourselves as sinners. You all know that, right? That Scripture does not refer to believers walking after Christ, even imperfect believers, as sinners per se. We are referred to as saints. We have a positional place in the family of God. It's an amazing thing. doesn't mean that we're without sin, that we don't need an advocate. But it means that God, we have a different position and relationship with God than prior to Christ. And the fact is that as when Jesus died for sinners, and so when he did that, we think, well, yeah, okay, that's good. I've heard that since I was a kid. I was bad and he died for me. But here's, the, here's what I want you to get. A lot of times we don't really realize how bad we really are or were.
You see, they didn't realize how bad they were until the bright light of the truth and the law of God was sh as shown upon their hearts. And all of a sudden they're like, stunned. Like, oh, we're in big trouble. I mean, we're in serious trouble. We have been, in our kings and everybody behind us, we have been really bad. I mean, not like bad, but really bad, unconscionably bad, evil, wicked. And when you look at all the descriptions of the heart of man throughout the Scripture, you find that the Scripture pretty much puts mankind in the same category. In Romans 1, it says that wrath has been stored up for the wicked, like literally accumulating wrath. You know what wrath is, right? It's God's anger. So, you know, but I thought God loved all the sinners. Well, he does. But he also has unsatisfied justice regarding the rebellion of man towards God. And they remain condemned. The world remains condemned. The world remains under the wrath of God until we come under the new covenant of Jesus. And the, by and large, the world is not very self-conscious of how bad or awful they really are. And many of us, when we came to Christ, did not really fully grasp it either. And over time, we begin to grasp. But that's one of the reasons that people think that hell is so severe. The reason that we often think hell, and listen, there, there are you know, some perspectives of hell that might shed some light on this. But there is a place of torment. There is a place of separation from God. And there is a final ultimate judgment of which everyone will have to face. But a lot of times when we look at there's a severity. Remember in the Romans it says, Behold the kindness and severity of God. The kindness and severity of God. And so oftentimes people look at that and go, Well, how could God be severe with, with anybody? But the only reason that bugs us and the only reason it bothers us is because we don't realize how evil and wicked and diabolical human beings are in their attitude and disposition towards God in His goodness and His love. The arrogance, the self-centeredness, the agenda-centered motivations of our lives. And that's why to come to Christ we must accept Him as Lord. We must come to that place of surrender where we begin to say, hey, wait a minute. I'm not just bringing God alongside like some saddlebag or a spare tire. But He becomes central to my life, to my thinking, to my choices, to the way I choose to build my life. There must be a surrender to the government, the righteous and good government of God, or there is no basis for God to extend grace to us. It's a simple condition. It's what the New Testament calls repentance. And that's what's often missing in so many people's lives today when they supposedly come to Christ. It's there's no surrender or deep repentance. Because we think we're not really that bad. And so the law came. And in many ways, the law must come back to America. We must begin to uphold the moral law of God once again so that we can realize we are in desperate and in very dire need of a Savior. So that was an aside that actually most of that one in my notes. But one of the reasons that people think hell is too severe is that they do not understand how severe their sin and rebellion has been. We have become such experts at shifting blame, we go to great lengths to avoid the pain of guilt. And because of the pain of guilt, we excuse and we shift blame and we find ways to not have to deal with it. But the only way that we really can ultimately deal with guilt is to be honest and to come before God and say, I was wrong. And it's then that He extends grace. It's then that we can have cleansing. He did not die for self-justifying individuals. He did not die for the righteous. He died for the wicked. So sin has a dulling effect on the conscience. Interesting verse, Jesus, in the, he said in the last days, he says that because lawlessness has increased, most people's love will grow cold. So let's continue reading through 2 Kings. Then the king sent 
And they gathered to him all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem. The king went up to the house of the Lord and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him. And the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great, he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which was found in the house of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord, to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to carry out the words of this covenant that were written in this book and all the people entered into the covenant. I want you to notice something very important here. This completely shoots down the doctrine of inability. In other words, moral inability, the, the idea that people cannot keep the law of God. How many times have you heard it said that Israel could not keep? And I've asked, I'll ask people this question. Could Israel keep the law of God? And almost always people say, no, they could not. So, but the Bible never says that. Read Psalm 119. Read through Deuteronomy and you find out when he says the word of faith is in your heart. Not far from you. It's not across the ocean where you can't reach it. But it's there in your mouth so that you will do it. And here you have the same essence. We are going to do it. We're going to obey. We're going to follow the ways of God. We are making a covenant to do it. You see, we have even doctrines today that excuse us from our moral responsibility by saying, well, we can't help it anywhere. We're just all sinners. But that's not how God sees it. The scripture mostly decide, des, describes us as intentional rebels, not helpless victims. But we're in a culture and society that likes the idea of being helpless victims so that we can excuse ourselves. Saying, Pastor, this is so heavy. I wanted to come to church and feel good. Now look what you've done. <laughs> you see... Well, you say, well, man, that's just like getting really heavy. But here's the thing. You've got to hear. You've got to hear the silver lining here. Jesus did not die for your mistakes. He did not die for unintentional sin. He did not die. Read through the book of Hebrews and see what he actually died for. Jesus, it says... He was the completion what the law could not do. The law always took care of unintentional sin. The law always took care of the mistakes. The law always took care of, see? But it was intentionally incomplete because only Jesus could actually pay for and satisfy the debt to justice from intentional, willful, premeditated sin against God. And so Jesus is the only one that could do that. If all we had in our lives was mistakes and we meant well, then why would Jesus need to come? Bulls and goats would cover that. But he took care of the hard stuff. He took care of the deep issue, the root problem of man and his selfishness. So let's continue. Second Kings. I got you thinking yet this morning? 1 Kings 23, However, the Lord did not turn from the fierceness of, his, of fierceness of his great wrath with which his anger burned against Judah because of all the provocations with which Manasseh had provoked him. The Lord said, I will remove Judah also from my sight. Also meaning in addition to Israel. I will remove Judah also from my sight as I have removed Israel and I will cast off Jerusalem. This city I have chosen and the temple of which I said my name shall be here. Now listen, when you hear that last phrase in this text, the part I highlighted, you have to hear the tension, the heartbreak in God's tone here. See, it was that heartbreak that Jesus ultimately expressed on the cross. He says, Jerusalem was God's... Yahweh loved Jerusalem. He loved Israel. He loved Judah. 
So, well, it's all going according to plan. No, no, it's not. There's a, there's a spirit of tragedy here. See, a lot of times we, we have these theological ideas of, well, after all, it's just going the way it's planned. No, no, no. It is not. Then why did Jesus say, this is how you pray? That your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And why would he say pray that way? Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Because his kingdom is not on earth the way it is. In, and his will is not being done on earth as it is being done in heaven. That's why Jesus, I, one of my most oft-quoted scriptures, when he weeps before Jerusalem. And here we are talking about Jerusalem, rejecting God. God having to apprehensively bring judgment to Jerusalem and even Judah. And Jesus had said, I wanted to gather you as a hen does her chicks, but you stoned the prophets. You, the people I sent to you, he said, but you would not. That's why there's judgment. So there's a long list, long list of decadent practices of the Israelites. You can look through the Bible, you can find most of them. Among them were prostitution rings, child sacrifice, Widespread idol worship, worship of the constellations, deep occult practices and divination, practicing of sodomy and prostitution as religious rituals, even, even in the temple. Remember that Manasseh, although repentant, had set in motion something in the heart of the people that was unrelenting. Josiah's legacy, one of the restoring it was one of restoring Israel's heritage as a chosen people and the laws of God. His mission was to restore an entire generation to their heritage as God's people and God's given destiny. To restore them to the good and upright moral law of God. He was willing to take whatever drastic steps were necessary to do it. Today we have an emerging generation. And this may extend past Gen Z, Gen, Gen uh, Millennials may extend into Gen X. In other words, it's a progressive thing. It's progressing in, in many ways worse and worse, not in every way. But today we have an emerging generation that has lost the book, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, there, there are very possibly folks here this morning that essentially, even though you're in church and even though you're familiar with the Bible, you may have lost the book. In other words, have no clue about what God really thinks and believes and teaches and says about certain things. I talk to young people all the time that just there's a gradual process of trying to pull people back to the book. So I do these Wednesday night meetings. They're not for entertainment. I, I don't do Wednesday nights here just to say, hey, there's something we're doing cool on Wednesday night. Because I, for me, I have an agenda here, and that is to bring us back to the book. Because ultimately, that's the only thing that's going to save America. And we have our little sphere here. But hopefully others all over the nation are getting it and understanding that we have lost the book, and many in the church have lost the book too. Here's four things that tell me that we've lost the book. And we need to rediscover the book. Number one, there's a wide, enthusiastic, note that, enthusiastic acceptance of homosexuality and gay marriage today, almost on a fanatical basis. Now, if, I, if you heard me say that right now and you feel offended, then you need the book. Then you have lost the book. If you're on YouTube and you're listening and you're offended with my number one, my first point out of four, and you're offended by that, then you have lost the book. Listen up. Number two, say, well, oh, that's a good thing. I'm not a homosexual. <laughs> All right, so number two, there's no one's going to escape this. Y'all know that. This generation's acceptance and willingness to abort their own children. Human sacrifice. So, oh, well, so, man, Manasseh was really, really bad. He was really bad. They offered their children in ben Ginnom, which became, you know, what we call Gehenna. They were really bad then. And I just want you to note right now that so have we. 
Because why are we aborting all these children? Because of our own selfishness. And we could go into all kinds of reasons that we have this today, but the fact that people justify it on the floor of the Senate, on the floor of the House, with no embarrassment, with nothing abashed about it, to justify the killing of unborn babies all the way to the point of the birth canal. We should be worried, ladies and gentlemen. This is one of the reasons I listen to some of the prophetic streams, and I appreciate them, and I listen to them, but I, I want you to understand, from a historical context, no matter how much they say that everything is going to go great, it's all going to turn around, America's coming, revival's coming, and I'll just tell you, it still involves choices. And nothing is in the bag. The wide acceptance of sex outside of marriage and cohabitation today. 46% of evangelical Christians believe in sex outside of marriage is acceptable. That's from a Pew study in 2020. 46% of evangelical Christians. And you don't think that we have a problem? We have lost the book. So, number four. The wide acceptance of Darwinism. Among 18 to 29-year-olds in general in the United States, 72% of them have bought in hook, line, and sinker or Darwinism. So, well, it's probably not so bad. Oh, yeah, no, it's, it is bad. Because it lays the foundation for their worldview. And the foundation of their worldview lays the groundwork for rejecting the Scripture. It's Genesis history. So, among evangelicals, we're a little better. Only 38% of evangelicals have embraced Darwinism. Okay, so that means that y'all are evangelicals, right? Well, I mean, maybe you're not all, but presumably we're an evangelical church, and most of you are going to be 90%, I would say, are probably evangelicals here. That means the odds are that close to 40% of you are struggling with whether Darwinism is true. And I want to know, if you're the case, why you weren't there Wednesday night. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about it. Let's talk science. It's one of my favorite subjects. Our case has never been stronger. The diabolical nature of the evolutionary dogma, I mean, it is diabolical. It's, it is absolute layers and layers of lies and vast numbers of the population have been deceived by this and it's undermining the entire foundation and we've lost the book each one of us each one of these things these four and this is just four i could keep going i think four is enough you know i've probably already stopped preaching and started dabbling in your personal life at this point. So each one of these is an affront to the sacred institutions of God, the family, marriage, the virtue and dignity of having and raising children, and the sanctity of human life. You say, well, pastor, where does this lead toward restoration of legacy? We're getting there. But first, I'm going to, I'm going to, work this a little bit more I want us to get it because because unless sometimes we can embrace the problem it's hard to embrace the restoration so I'm gonna this is scenario we're gonna call it a counterfactual single young adult exercise I think there's quite a few single young adults in the room so I want you to consider the long-term ramifications of one decision how could you choose to date and eventually marry who you choose how could who you choose to date and eventually marry could affect the future? In other words, think about the cascading consequences of one single choice. Well, if I choose a person of this nature and character, where does that lead and what are the ramifications? What are the dominoes that will fall in place? If I choose to marry somebody of this character and quality, 
How will that affect my future? See, the decisions that you make, as far as even choosing who you will settle down with and marry, affects children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. It has a long-term effect. And so the responsibility, it's no game. This is not like, you know, love's a game, and I feel, oh, I've been around this person, I feel so, you know, and all this, and, and you know, they love me, I guess I better sleep with them to prove it, you know, and all this nonsense. So, so if we were to kind of work that exercise, we could give the scenarios and then look at, okay, well, if I did this, then what would happen if this, 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 this? Just look at the whole sliding dominoes hitting each other. So here I'm going to give you a myth, and I'm going to show you why it matters. Most young adults today believe that cohabitation actually increases the odds of a successful marriage. That's what most of them believe. You know, you try it before you buy it. It's like a used car. Ooh, that hurt. So the trend is now cohabitating. Cohabitating is the trend couples uh, of cohabitating in multiple successions. Maybe that explains why 70% of cohabitating or, or cohabitate, cohabitating at some point in their lives because of this kind of philosophical, moral view. And yet young adults today, here's the contradiction, more than ever are searching for a solid marriage relationship. So that's a hopeful thing. They're searching for a solid marriage relationship. The other hopeful thing is the Gen Z, the youngest people, and the early millennials coming along are beginning to adopt a more pro-life position. They are, I think, a very large percentage of the majority of them are wanting more restrictions on abortion. Um, a small minority of them now want just unlimited abortion. So though, there are some encouraging things kind of happening out there. One of them is that they are crying out for the keys, the secret to having a solid marriage relationship. What do I do today to get from point A to point B? Because that is what I want. And you know, ladies and gentlemen, we, the church, we, the people of God, have the answer to that. But yet, they're undermining the very thing they want by this whole cohabitating thing. And I'll explain to you why that is. So this is really just a big example of how we've lost the book. Cohabitation versus marriage. I'm going to run through these real quick. These are stats. These are from a number of different studies over a number of years. Cohabitation versus marriage. Household violence twice as high. Women are five times more likely to suffer depression than married women. Cohabitators twice as likely to suffer from any mental illness. Infidelity is twice as high. Children in poverty, 31% versus 6% in married households. Cohabit, cohabitating men are four times more likely to cheat on their partner in a given year. Likelihood cohabitation will lead to marriage, not lead to marriage. Thank you, I was hearing myself say it out loud, and that's not right. 87%. Okay, 87% likelihood cohabitation will never lead to marriage. Not real good odds here. And will it lead to a solid marriage? Nope. Significantly higher chance of divorce were they to become married. More children than ever are now born, born to cohabitating couples, most of which will not lead to marriage, and most of which will dissolve, and there are more single parents. So we have a generation that in many ways is in a lot of pain over this because on one hand they have ideas they've adopted to say, well, you know, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be a Quaker about it. I don't want to be a Puritan about it. But at the same time, we want the results of godliness, but not living by the precepts of godliness. Kind of like trying to have it both ways. So I want to conclude, so you hear what I'm saying. I'm saying that this is a generation that's lost the book. So, well, boy, I'm sure glad you shared all that with me because I, I kind of thought like, like the mainstream culture, the mainstream, I was kind of like that, like, you know, try it before you buy it and all that, right? It's real common. There are a lot of young people in churches that are cohabitating. It's possible, you know, 
And so, uh, or, or if they're not living together, they're sleeping around. So all these things are part of the same thing. And the consequences to this type of behavior is, is beyond comprehension on our culture. So if we teach people year after year for decades that they're just animals, then why would we be shocked if they behave like animals? Remember number four earlier? So, lessons from Josiah. So we need to get back to the book. You say, oh, yeah, well, now that I see that, I can see why the Bible says not to commit adultery and fornication and all this other stuff. Well, now it makes sense, right? Well, but the Bible told us before I gave you the stats. The Bible is still true before I ever gave you the stats. But we didn't want to believe the Bible. We've got to have the studies to prove the Bible has credibility. We've got to come back to the book. All right, so five quick lessons from Josiah. His deep convictions develop between 16 to 20 years old. Never underestimate the deep work in a young person. He developed deep, authentic, a deep and authentic relationship with the Lord. Number two, Josiah rose above his family's broken legacy, and so can you. Manasseh and Ammon and Hezekiah, all these losers, he somehow rose above it all. He, he brought the greatest reforms, the greatest revival, the greatest restoration of Israel ever known. In fact, the scripture says there's no other king before him or after him that could rival what he did for Israel. But even with all of that, it was not enough to circumvent the eventual judgment. But the eventual judgment was because God was determined to set them aside. So it's essentially he created a reset in Babylon and then brought them back and restored them so that Israel could still be the, the means, the mechanism for delivering Messiah to the world. Number three, although he was a young king, he understood that his leadership could influence many. He took responsibility and was willing to repent publicly. Number four, he deeply loved and respected God's word and was willing to act decisively to obey it. His entire life, his national leadership, were centered around the truth of God's word. He was a man of the book. He was a man of action, number five, willing to do whatever it took as long as it took to restore Judah. It took two kind of seasons or periods of restoration and they lasted years, many years. One place it says that the idols, they pulverize them to dust. I thought that was cool. Okay, we got another idol, Josiah. We dug one up in so-and-so's backyard. What do we do with it? Pulverize it. I mean, grind it down until it's nothing but dust. Now, that would be a little challenging with the gold idols. To convert gold back into dust would be a little challenging, but that's what it says they did. They, they, I mean, they were serious because they didn't want to leave anything that could be remolded into an idol too easily. They wanted to make it really, really hard. They had to start from scratch. It was a huge reset. So, uh, so I'm gonna, I want to make sure as I'm concluding that if you're on, online, a lot of times online right now they leave. But I don't want you to leave right now. If you're online, don't leave. I want you to hear this last part. It's very important because it goes to the very core of what we're talking about, restoring a legacy. You want to restore a legacy? If you're saying, man, I think maybe I'm, on tra I'm off track. I think maybe I'm... Just look at the life of Josiah. Look at what he was willing to do. Look at the depth of repentance. Look how he re-embraced the lost book. And that's where it always begins. No matter how messed up, no matter how far off track your life has gotten, the fact is that at whatever point, better late than never, you can have that, that point of restoration as we re-embrace the Word of God and honor God in His ways. So, so sometimes we're coming from a very broken place taking back the legacy that God has for us. 
So I want to uh, talk about Jeanette and I. Because in a way, we had a legacy handed to us that was, it wasn't good. Both of our dads, it's not like, you know, we're Christians today because we're just, you know, good Christians and we came up with a good family. And on the contrary, nothing like that. We came from a broken family. I came from a broken family. Jeanette came from a broken family. Our parents were both divorced. And our dads both committed multiple adulterous affairs. And so we had all of that baggage coming into our Christian walk. And I came to the Lord when I was 16. She came to the Lord earlier than that. But here's what I want you to understand is how did we create? We were like a Josiah generation. Because what we did is we, we abandoned the kind of the trajectory of our family and how it was headed and where it was going for generations. And so we abandoned that and we started over. And the way we started over is we started over in Christ. And the only way I know to express this except that when we came to the Lord, we came with a deep repentance and a deep surrender. And we embraced the book. No matter what it was going to cost us, we decided we are going to follow Jesus. And we're going to live out that life, our entire life, until it's on our tombstone. That's the kind of commitment we made. This was not something we're going to try for a while. It's so lame. You know, people that, well, I'm going to try. I felt the Lord. I think I'll try Him for a while. Well, maybe I'll try the church for a while. I might go, you know, try it out, whatever. Nonsense. There needs to be some resolve and commitment just like Josiah embraced the book and said, this is what it says. We're going to do it. That's repentance. So no matter how broken we were coming into our our new Christian life, no matter how bad the legacy being handed off to us was, we were able to rise above all of that Because in Christ, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We knew the power of God to transform us, to transform our thinking, to transform our hearts, to transform our our motivations. All of it, top to bottom, was completely revised, if you will. It's it's almost like we were reborn. Uh Uh-huh. It's like we were saved, but we were saved saved. See, I, you know, you love all these people that they're like, oh, yeah, I, I think I might have gotten saved. Oh, yeah, I don't know. But I think, you know, I mean, oh, come on. Okay, so you met, you met him. You met the creator of the entire universe. And you met him, but you're unchanged. How does that work? I, I'm not sure I understand that. If you have met him, how are you unchanged? Mm Mm-hmm. So. That's it. As simple as that is, that's the key. And Josiah exemplified it. Go back and study those chapters. He exemplified what it takes to have that reset, to have that complete restoration of a legacy. So Josiah in history, even though he was dumb with the king of Egypt, he goes down as the greatest king in Israel ever. In many ways, his life paralleled Messiah. It's, uh, it's an amazing thing. So Jesus told us all along, I, I speak this in every wedding I do, every wedding ceremony I do, I reflect on the words of Jesus. And he said, the house built on the rock, that when the wind and rain and storm descends, that house is unmoved, that house stands no matter what and that's the type of foundations we need to be building and I think sometimes we the church and have lowered the bar so far in our expectations are you a person of the book this morning could you stand with me I mean really are you a person of the book I think if I recall, that's what ISIS was calling Jews and Christians, people of the book. Are we people of the book? Yes, Lord. Are you building your life on the ways of God? Are you 
prepared to make decisions that honor God first, even if they may appear to be drastic. This is the essence of what it really means to be a follower of Jesus. What it means to be a disciple. Are you in? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm in, but I can't get up for church on Sunday morning. You see? It's easy to say things. Hmm. Could you uh, let's just take a moment and just, if, you're, if you can do this with a genuine heart, lift your hands to the Lord. And lifting our hands to the Lord is just a simple expression of coming with a humble heart with contrition with a nothing to hide we're coming with a gesture of receiving but also a gesture of giving it's a it's a it's an expression of openness i'm not hiding i don't have any weapons you know? so if you could raise your hands and Lord Jesus, may we may we be the people of the book. As we live our lives, may we reflect the integrity of the Lord. And no matter how many mistakes, and listen, I want to say this is kind of embedded in my prayer, but no matter how many mistakes you've made, no matter how far off track you may have gone, no matter how lost you may have thought you were, you may have been off on all four of those points. But you know what? You can fix that like that. You can you can simply repent and come back to the Lord and say, Lord, that's grace. Grace is extended to us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Behold the kindness and severity of God, but behold the kindness of God that will come to us, that will pursue us, that will allow us even later in life to reestablish a legacy that glorifies God. Lord, may we be that. May we glorify you in the way that we choose to live our lives. I pray for anyone here this morning that doesn't truly know you or doesn't understand you or they're not really people of the book even though they may be churchgoers. Lord, I pray for anyone here this morning that there would be just a realization Holy Spirit, how, 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 how does our country have any hope if we can't get it right? So God, we pray for the church all over America, that the church would begin to re-embrace the book without shame, not ashamed of the truth, no matter how much they may be ridiculed for it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for your goodness. Thank you for for the price you paid for our sin and for our restoration. And And God, I pray for every person in this room, if there's anyone here that's just saying, I need a restoration of legacy in my life. That, Lord, that this is the message of hope. It's that we can rise above wherever we've been, whatever our past was, whatever our previous generations, Lord, we're no longer victims, but we are victors. We commit this time to you in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen.